Thank you. Um, hi again, everyone. Uh, so we are, thanks for joining this session. We're gonna talk a little bit about the thing that all of us have been talking about for the last couple of years, COVID. Uh, <laughs> the, the COVID pandemic uh, taught us all so much, uh, like how much our hair grows in a year or so. Um, I remember reading about the 1919 flu pandemic as an undergrad, and admittedly, I'm far from a historian or an epidemiologist, but my sense is that experts will probably write this history uh, of the pandemic for the rest of our lives. So um, fortunately for all of you, uh, our presenters have started digging into some of the questions about what happened and how systems need to change. So. I'm looking forward to it. Before we get started, uh, I want to thank this session's sponsor, Milliman Med Insight. Um, we appreciate your support. And now let me introduce your moderator, Helen Figge, uh, Chief Strategy Officer at MedicaSoft. And take it away, Helen. Here you go. Thank you, Charles. And welcome, everyone, to NATO's 37th Annual Conference, Putting Healthcare Data to Work. Um, today, we're going to be talking about using health data to measure the impacts of COVID-19. Some fantastic um, speakers that you're going to learn some really good insights from. And um, I really want to get moving on this so we have enough time for questions and answers. And our first uh, topic up, which I find very interesting and intriguing, is um, from Fair Health, the monthly telehealth regional tracker the evolution of new data tool during the COVID-19 pandemic. Robin Gilbert will be presenting, and we have um, Ali Russo who will be following up for um, Fair Health with um, any questions, comments, and um, in additional insights. So let's uh, start first with hearing what Robin has to say. Thank you for joining today's session. My name is Robin Gilbert and I am the president of Fair Health. I look forward to sharing with you how Fair Health has tracked telehealth before and during the COVID-19 pandemic with our comprehensive collection of telehealth data. For those less familiar with Fair Health, we are a national independent not-for-profit organization with the largest private claims collection in the country. We now have over 38 billion private insurance claims and receive over 2 billion new claim lines each year. The data are organized into 493 discrete geographic areas or geozips. Such markets tend to track with the first three digits of a zip code. The data are received voluntarily and reflect both self-insured and fully insured covered lives. Using our data repository, FairHealth began tracking the growth of telehealth long before its rapid expansion during the COVID-19 pandemic. In July 2019, we released a white paper on the emergence and contours of the telehealth landscape. Once the pandemic hit our shores, FairHealth tapped into our extensive telehealth data collection to provide a clear window into this evolving venue of care. Toward that end, we launched the free online tool, the monthly telehealth regional tracker. The original iteration of the telehealth tracker launched in May 2020 compared a month in 2020 with its corresponding month in 2019 to show the dynamic changes in utilization associated with virtual visits before and after the onset of the pandemic. Each infographic included findings on the volume of telehealth claim lines, urban versus rural usage, the top five telehealth procedure codes, and the top five telehealth diagnoses. A year after launching the telehealth tracker, FairHealth enhanced the tool to offer additional insights into telehealth's evolution. Rather than comparing the same month across years, the updated tracker offered a month-to-month -month comparison. The data fields evaluated in the new tracker included telehealth's volume of claim lines, top procedure codes, top diagnoses, and top mental health diagnoses. Fair Health's third year of reporting on the month-to-month -month evolution of telehealth brought more notable changes to the tracker. The new features in 2022 include telehealth's top five specialties and the telehealth cost corner, which presents a different telehealth procedure each month with its median charge amount and median allowed amount. Continuing from previous years are changes in telehealth volume of claim lines, the top five telehealth procedure codes, and the top five telehealth diagnoses. 
In June, Fairhill published a brief offering a multi-year retrospective of the findings made available through the telehealth tracker. Focusing on the period from January 2020 to March 2022, it reports on various descriptive aspects of telehealth at national and regional levels before and throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. The brief also focuses on how the telehealth tracker itself has evolved in response to the needs of stakeholders The data featured in the following charts and visualizations reflect private healthcare claims data, as well as data associated with Medicare Advantage plans. These two charts show how telehealth usage as a percentage of all medical claim lines evolved over 2020 and 2021. As you can see, the percentage of telehealth claim lines was relatively low in early 2020 prior to the onset of the pandemic. In March, as the pandemic began taking hold, telehealth claim lines increased and continued to increase in April. However, as COVID-19 restrictions expired later in the year, telehealth utilization declined. And by September 2020, telehealth accounted for 4.3% of all medical claim lines. We see telehealth utilization rise again in October 2020 through January 2021 which was likely a result of the growing number of COVID-19 cases in the U.S. during this time. In the spring and summer of 2021, telehealth claim lines dropped again as the country began to get vaccinated. In the fall and winter of 2021, telehealth utilization began to rise again, likely a result of individuals taking precautions and avoiding indoor spaces to protect against new COVID variants. Here we are reporting on the top 10 procedures conducted via telehealth nationally. In 2020, the most common telehealth procedures were evaluation and management or ENM services, psychotherapy visits, and telephone services, all of varying lengths. In 2021, we see a 60 minute psychotherapy service become the top ranking telehealth procedure code nationally. On this slide, we are reviewing the top 10 telehealth diagnoses nationally. In 2020, mental health conditions far exceeded any other condition as the top telehealth diagnosis. Joint soft tissue diseases and issues was in second place, though its percentage of telehealth claim lines was much lower at 4.2%. Developmental disorders and acute respiratory diseases and infections ranked third and fourth respectively. In 2021, mental health share of telehealth claim lines rose from the previous year. Substance use disorders, which was not on the list in 2020, emerged as the fifth most common telehealth diagnosis in 2021. Both exposure to communicable diseases and skin infections and issues, which appeared on the 2020 list, fell from the national ranking in 2021. Here we are reviewing the distribution of telehealth and office visits for mental health services in 2020. In January and February 2020, we see that mental health services were primarily rendered in an office setting. But in March and April, when states banned non-emergency medical visits and patients avoided in-person care for fear of infection with COVID-19, telehealth surged as a venue of care for mental health conditions. By April, telehealth had far surpassed the office as the chosen setting for mental health treatment. This change was not only sustained, but fairly stable from April to November 2020. In December 2020, telehealth for mental health services climbed even higher. In 2021, telehealth continued to outdistance an office setting for mental health treatment. That year, utilization of telehealth for mental health services peaked nationally in January. Although telehealth remained the primary venue for treatment, we saw a slight decrease in mental health services via telehealth in the summer and early fall of 2021. In September, 58% of mental health services were rendered via telehealth, while 42% took place in an office setting. However, telehealth services rose slightly again by December capturing nearly 61% of mental health services. 
In 2020 and 2021, the individuals most commonly utilizing telehealth for mental health services were those aged 21 to 35. The second most common grouping was the 36 to 50 year old age bands. The over 65 cohort accounted for three to 3.5% of mental health services. When reviewing the top 10 specialties treating patients via telehealth in 2020, we see that primary care physician was the leading specialty. Social worker was followed closely behind, accounting for just about 23% of telehealth claim lines. The rest of the specialties comprised a much smaller share of telehealth claim lines. Psychologist, primary care non-physician, and psychiatrist captured 7.6%, 7.4% and 7.4% of telehealth claim lines, respectively. Specialist physicians, such as cardiologists, surgeons, and gastroenterologists, physical or occupational therapists, psychiatric nurse, clinic facility, and specialist surgeon made up the final five specialties on the list of top 10 specialties treating patients via telehealth. There were some notable differences in the top 10 telehealth specialties in 2021. Social worker rose in the ranking to the number one telehealth specialty, switching places with primary care physician, which ranked as number two in 2021. Because the most common telehealth service social workers provide is psychotherapy, this trend was likely attributable to the increasing share of mental health conditions among telehealth diagnoses in 2021. This can also likely serve as the explanation for the increased share of telehealth claim lines among psychiatrists and psychologists in 2021. Also in 2021, specialties like physical therapy and clinic facility dropped from the list while addiction medicine and speech language and pathologists emerged. Thank you for this opportunity to share our telehealth data. If you would like to review any of our telehealth resources, again, you can find them on our website at fairhealth.org. We look forward to addressing any questions you may have shortly. Thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, um, we really have two questions, Ali, on behalf of Robin's um, presentation. And I think I'll just do one or two at a time so we'll continue the momentum. But um, overall, Cindy wants to know, did the uh, volume of mental health services increase during COVID? the telehealth plus face-to-face? -face. So we actually have seen an uptick in the volume of mental health services that are being provided to various different age cohorts. We have a white paper that we put out um, uh, late last year that indicated um, even within the pediatric population that many of the mental health and substance use disorders were increasing. And then we also had a subsequent substance use disorder paper that we put out recently that also showed the increase in, of both substance use disorders as well as overdoses. And Ellie, how did you identify telehealth encounters? Alyssa would like to know. Um, you know, we realize there are telehealth CPT codes and modifiers, but curiously, um, is it a straightforward process? Can you um, can you expand on those thoughts? Um, so it's a little more convoluted. It's not a straightforward process. While there are CPT codes that are designated specifically for telehealth, as you mentioned, there's also places of service. There are modifiers, and it's the combination of all three that we're utilizing to indicate a telehealth visit. So when it's this or that or that, um, also keeping in mind that in a lot of cases, there are four modifiers that are provided. So that is what um, we're using to indicate telehealth. <laughs> Wonderful. And my last question before we get on to Trudy is, um, why did you use a count of claim lines as a denominator in many of the measures? So that's a great question. We're actually utilizing claim lines as opposed to patients because of the fact that one patient may go in person one day for a, a month and then go seven times telehealth in a month. So rather than constrain ourselves to the individual patient, we're able to actually capture that full utilization as opposed to just the individual um, person. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you, Allie. And uh, thank Robin um, Gilbert as well from Fair Health, both of you for phenomenal um, insights into your regional tracker. I'd like to go on now to Trudy uh, Millard Krauss from um, University Health, the Center for Healthcare Data in Utah Health. And she is going to discuss a COVID-19 severity score for use with claims data, which I think will be very thought provoking. So Trudy, uh, looking forward to your thoughts. Hi, I'm Trudy Millard Krauss. I'm a professor with the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston in the School of Public Health. And I'm also co-director of our Center for Healthcare Data. I'm here to talk to you today about the COVID-19 severity score that we developed for use with claims data. The COVID-19 pandemic was um, resulted in, a, in a, a great deal of need for research on the disease. At the time of the disease in 2020, it was important to take a look at existing clinical components to help predict uh, risk, mortality, and severity of condition. Now that the disease has um, moved on uh, that we've received some vaccines there have been a variety of variants and we're experiencing reduced mortality we're starting to look more at its impact on the population and on long-term health and the long-term effects of COVID-19 itself and to do so we're able to rely on claims data for longitudinal research uh, to support public health analyses and research and claims data has been very useful for that so we modeled a COVID-19 severity score off the one developed by the World Health Organization, and they developed the clinical progression scale in, in collaboration with the International Forum for Acute Care Trialists and the International Severe Acute Respiratory and Emergency Infections Consortium. And this progression scale measured the viral burden of COVID-19 and assessed the patient trajectory and use of resources over the course of treatment for COVID-19. So it relied on clinical metrics. It had 10 levels of patient progression, starting with score zero, which was uninfected, and ranged all the way up to score 10, which was death from COVID-19. So we modified this because administrative claims data seldom has any sort of clinical values, such as lab values or oxygen levels, anything like that. Um, so those were not available in claims data. So we modified it to be able to use procedure codes uh, to identify use of resources and levels of severity. The COVID-19 diagnosis was identified in claims data in two different ways based on two different time periods. After April 2020, the CDC provided uh, diagnosis codes of U07.1, U07.2, or U10. Prior to that time, if the uh, infection occurred during January 2020 or April 20, to April 2020, the following combination of codes could be used, and this was uh, received from guidance again by CDC. So if those combinations occurred, it could be presumed to be COVID. We also had a progressive level of uh, scores for severity. Ours started at one, which was uh, deemed to be self-report only without a documented diagnosis, and ranged all the way up to nine where death occurred in an inpatient setting. So the low levels of severity were level one. Um, level one is to be used for COVID analysis when the infection is self-report. Uh, and the only COVID-19 codes that existed were C86.16 or Z U08 or U09 or B94.8. Uh, and we'll talk about those in a minute. And these represent a personal history code, which indicates self-report. So levels two and three were indica indications of ambulatory uh, diagnosed COVID infection, but no progression to an emergency department visit or an admission for COVID. So level two was COVID-19, but asymptomatic, and level three was COVID-19 with symptoms, and the symptoms were defined by CDC guidance and indicated pneumonia, acute bronchitis, lower respiratory infection, acute respiratory distress syndrome, cough, shortness of breath, or fever. The mid-levels were level four and five, where level four was presentation to an emergency department, but no further progression to an inpatient admission or death from COVID at the emergency room. Levels five were inpatient admission with a COVID diagnosis, but there was no use of oxygen during the admission and no further progression and no death in the facility. 
Level six was inpatient admission, where there was a use of non-invasive oxygen, but no further progression and no death. Level seven, still an inpatient admission. However, it required use of mechanical ventilation for oxygen, uh, but yet no further progression or death. Level eight was an inpatient admission where there was use of mechanical ventilation and renal dia dialysis or mechanical ventilation and ECMO, but no further progression to death. And level nine, inpatient admission where death occurred within that inpatient admission or after transfer to another facility. So in studying the sequelae of COVID-19 or the long-term effects of COVID-19, uh, the following codes are important for consideration. And the top part of the table, these codes are presumptive of COVID-19 if there is no other diagnosis code existent in the uh, historical data. So U08 or Z86.16 both indicate personal history of COVID-19 and are, are presumed to be self-report. However, the codes on the lower part of the table uh, identify post-COVID conditions and sequelae and may appear without a confirmatory COVID-19 code. So U09 with any other diagnosis code indicates a post-COVID-19 condition. And a U09.9 indicates a post-COVID-19 condition unspecified. And then on the bottom of the table, B94.8 indicates a sequelae of uh, um, an inf a specified infectious condition. And so this can be used if uh, there is a prior diagnosis of COVID-19 within the data. So we applied these severity levels to a database that we had within our Center for Healthcare Data. And this was the Optum CDM database, uh, which contained medical claims for 2020 all of 2020 from January to December. It contained a total of 19,761,000 individuals uh, in the database. And so this was national data and 690,000 of those individuals had a diagnosis for COVID-19 within 2020. This was 3.5% of the total population, which is consistent with the infection rate during that time. So in this table, you will see the severity levels listed on top, two through nine, and the number of unique individuals that had the di diagnosis of COVID-19 that ultimately fell into those different severity levels for a total of 690,542 individuals. And then the data is further identified by age group on the lower part of the chart, uh, age groups of 0, 19, all the way up to 75 plus. And in those age groups, it will identify the count of individuals per severity level and the percentage of individuals in that age group in that severity level. We also took a look at the relationship between the severity level and the cost per person as well as the median length of stay. Now, we know that cost and length of stay are highly correlated, uh, so we expected to see a similar pattern here. And what we did find is that there was a relationship between cost, length of stay, and severity level, where both cost and length of stay uh, increased as severity levels increased. You'll note there's no, no length of stay on levels one to four because those did not indicate hospitalization, so length of stay is only relevant for levels five to nine. Now, an interesting thing to point out here is that uh, severity level did, level nine was not the highest cost nor the longest length of stay, but severity level eight was. And what we found was in level nine, individuals uh, by definition of being in level nine died within the hospital. And so their length of stay was less than level eight who uh, had a severe condition, but survived, but may have stayed in the hospital longer. One of the other things that we did for uh, groups that have uh, populations with whom we work, uh, they had an interest in seeing how COVID-19 affected their population in particular. So we created a Tableau visualization per each um, group that we work with to allow them to dig into some of the data to find out how it was impacting their population health. And what you see here is an example of one of the uh, health plans that we worked with. This indicates each of the severity level in a different circle by color. And on this particular screen, what you will see is the count of individuals from that particular population and the rate per thousand that reached that level of severity for COVID-19.
And this uh, was an interactive website that they could use and they could drill down deeper into each of the circles to get an average cost, average length of stay, and some other important data that was useful for them in evaluating the impact of COVID-19 on their population. So this severity scale that we developed has been submitted for publication and is currently under review. We hope that it will be pub published in uh, probably about three months, uh, but it is available for use by other researchers. That was the intention of creating it, that we would come up with a standardized methodology of an indicating severity of COVID-19 within claims data research. So I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. And I'm also providing my contact information if you'd like to reach out to me I'm happy to share more information with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trudy. And I want to correct myself. It's the University of Texas Health. So I want to make sure we give kudos to the University of Texas for this phenomenal work. I have a quick question that came through. Um, how will you be amending or updating the scale or its use? Can you clarify or help explain how, how the thought process of this will work. Yeah, thank you, Helen, for that question. Um, we, we are monitoring how we need to adjust the scale. One of the things that we've noticed is the category one, which is self-report, is something we really need to uh, review in greater detail. It's important for our scale because it's, um, it's, it's very significant when you're starting to look at the post-COVID and the long COVID effects. Uh, because many people suffered from COVID and didn't really have it documented in their claims data. So we need to keep it in there, but we're, we're really taking a look at how we might have to adjust tracking that element. And then the other thing that we're looking at is how we can incorporate vaccina vaccination codes and use that also for some of our analysis. And um, we're, we'll be modifying the uh, processes for that as well. And did you happen to look at comorbid um, states, uh, comorbid states of, of health um, that the, um, the patients may have had during this tracking? Can you explain or help us in any way um, understand what you saw, if at all? It could just be anecdotal, but, you know, there's a curiosity out there. Yeah, that's also a great question. And I'm really happy to say that many of our researchers at the university use this scale to do several papers looking at just that. Uh, we had someone from Dell Med take a look at people with autoimmune diseases and how that affected uh, their COVID experience. Uh, we also had many people from the Department of Psychiatry use it and found some very interesting things related to uh, comorbid conditions and uh, mental health conditions. So I would be happy to refer you to some of those papers that go into specifics on those comorbid states. Well, you know, this is very exciting because NADO is all about the data and what it's really telling us unbiasedly and what we're seeing. And, you know, as a board member, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished and our mission. And this feeds in quite nicely to the fact of what is the data telling us versus us telling people what we think the data is saying. And that's pretty powerful because healthcare is based on it, correct data, interpretation, use, and uh, best practices. So thank you, Trudy, for that phenomenal work at the University of Texas. Um, and if anyone has any questions, please um, type them in the box and we will circle back afterwards. Um, we have one more fantastic speaker, Alyssa Harris from Vizient, and she is going to talk about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on encounters for childhood vaccination. You know, we saw the CDC just come out with recommendations. There's a lot of, you know, um, uh, conversation about that and very interested to hear what Alyssa um, has found out and what, um, what the buzz is and moving forward. So Alyssa. Hi, my name is Alyssa Harris. I work at Vizient and today I'm going to be talking about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on encounters for childhood vaccination. So for background, in the beginning days of COVID, there were really a lot of unknowns that resulted in people avoiding the healthcare system because they were concerned about COVID-19. Um, and on the right, you can see that there were some racial ethnic disparities in, in who was avoiding the medical system. So on the left, you can see in that 
that read for urgent and emergent health care, Hispanic and Black non-Hispanic patients were avoiding the healthcare system at much higher rates than the Asian non-Hispanic and white non-Hispanic patients on the right. An April report from the CDC showed that from the 2019 pre-pandemic school year to 2020 um, school year right at the beginning of COVID, there was a 1% decrease in the kindergartners, percentage of kindergartners that received the required vaccines for that school year. And while 1% doesn't seem like a lot for 3 million kindergartners, that is over 30,000 kindergartners who were impacted and avoided the healthcare system um, relative to the year before. So it demonstrates some disruptions in, in those um, vaccines. So I wanted to look across vaccine encounters to look at the impact of the avoidance or delaying of healthcare due to the, the pandemic on, on these childhood vaccine encounters. And then looking at different age groups and racial and ethnic groups to see if we could see differences in, in the avoidance rates. And I wanted to see that if there was avoidance initially at the beginning in 2020, if in 2021, there was rebounding um, back to 2019 rates and maybe even some um, catching up for the, the missed encounters in 2020. So to do that, I use the Visigant Clinical Database, which is a facility-based administrative claims database. Um, I queried outpatient encounters for specific vaccine products in patients less than 18 years old between 2019, pre-pandemic, uh, and 2020, the first year of the pandemic, and then 2021, one year into the pandemic. And I found almost 850,000 encounters that had a CPT code for the specific vaccine products, um, excluding non-specific administration codes, as well as influenza codes. And while this is a busy slide, what this demonstrates is that there are some vaccine products, um, like the yellow at the top for DTAP and Tdap, that have a little more cyclical um, flow to them throughout the years, with um, some peaks around the start of the school year in the the July and August timeframe. Uh, and those same vaccines have bigger dips in that early pandemic, March, April, May of 2020, um, whereas other products such as Hep B and um, pneumococcal, pneumococcal is that lime green and Hep B is gray, are a lot flatter over time. And I think that will be demonstrated the reason why on the next slide, which is the age groups that have um, the rates by the age group. Um, as you can see in, in, the, in the yellow top line, that less than one year old um, cohort, while there is a slight decrease over time, you can see that there is a 12% and 14% decrease relative to 2019. Um, they are relatively flat throughout the year. There's, there's not a lot as much noise as compared to when you look at the purple line for five to 12 year olds um, and the gray line for 13 to 17 year olds where you see sharp peaks at the beginning of the school year. Um, and then it comes down for the, the winter and the early summer. And that group, as you can see, also have the biggest decrease in that avoidance in that early pandemic time. So March, April of 2020 had the um, mo more um, avoidance of encounters relative to the other age cohorts. But also you can see while in that first year, so in 2020 compared to 2019, the three to four, five to 12 and 13 to 17 year olds all had around 25% fewer encounters relative to 2019. That cohort actually had um, less of a decrease relative to 2019 when it came to 2021. So that they rebounded a bit from about 25% to more to the nine to 11% um, lower. So still overall lower, um, but actually the younger cohorts, less than one to one to two had more 14 to 16% avoidance relative to 2019. Um, when we look racially and ethnically, there are also some differences in, in the patterns of avoidance. So as you can see, there's the same trends overall. We have the overall decrease um, of almost 20% in 2020 compared to 2019, um, and then 13% decrease in 2021. And what's driving that are different racial ethnic groups. Um, in the first year of the pandemic of 2020, you can see that Hispanic, non-Hispanic Black, and non-Hispanic Asian patients all had over 20% decrease in encounters relative to their 2019 encounters. Um, while non-Hispanic white patients had 7.8% uh, decrease in their encounters. But in 2021, there's a little bit of a different story. Hispanic and non-Hispanic Asian patients had a, a smaller um, decrease in, in um, encounters relative to the year before. So 
they rebounded a little bit, still not at the 2019 rates, but non-Hispanic Blacks still had a decrease in uh, around 25% of encounters relative to 2019 um, in, in 2021. So they still had a, a persisting decrease relative to pre-pandemic times. And then hyper-focusing in on that really um, early March to June timeframe. If we look at 2019, there is some variation in that that time frame, but it is not really there's not really sharp peaks and valleys. But when it comes to 2020, you can see there's a very drastic dip in that time. Um, and so compared to that same time in 2019, for that early pandemic time, there were overall 35 percent fewer encounters, and that was really driven by that those Hispanic, non-Hispanic, Black, non-Hispanic Asians patients really avoiding um, encounters at a much higher rate as compared to, as you can see, 40% in Hispanic patients compared to a 20% decrease in non-Hispanic white patients. When we look at 2021, we again can see that there was rebound overall, so 14.5% decrease compared to 2019, but the highest rate is still in that non-Hispanic Black who have a 27% decrease relative to 2019, which is more than twice the rate of, of other groups. So the findings overall are that vaccine encounters are not consistent throughout the year for all patients, especially those older, um, older um, cohorts. There is an increase around the beginning of the school year into the fall for, for those adolescents. And while there were more vaccine encounters in 2021 relative to 2020, they're still not at the pre-pandemic 2019 volume, and they don't actually account for those missed encounters from 2020. So there's not more encounters to make up for those. Among racial ethnic groups, the non-Hispanic Black patients saw the largest decrease in encounters for vaccines and that highest rate of drop-off looking compared to 2019 rates. And Hispanic and non-Hispanic Asian patients saw a large decrease in 2020, but they closed that gap a little bit in 2021 compared to 2019. Um, for the first year of the pandemic, for age groups, um, adolescents had a much higher drop-off overall um, relative to those newborns and infants, probably because there's some elective um, bigger time frames to um, have those vaccines. But then when we look at 2021 compared to 2019, adolescents actually had a, they closed that gap and there was a, a lower rate of decrease compared to the 2019 volumes. Um, than, than in the newborn and infant population. So what are the implications? The implications are that the COVID-19 pandemic caused the disruptions that reduced the overall healthcare encounters for these um, vaccine encounters, especially in that early, early days of the pandemic. And even after almost two years um, since the start of the pandemic, those vaccine encounters didn't return to pre-pandemic levels and still persisted at, at lower levels than in 2019. So what providers can do is increase their follow-up with unvaccinated and under-vaccinated patients to reduce the impact of, of the uh, childhood diseases on, on those kids who might have missed those encounters. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation. Alyssa, that was wonderful. I have a few questions from the audience, um, and then we'll go into a general um, question and answer. But I just, you know, from a high level, we're seeing a lot of avoid avoidance in general of vaccinations in certain populations. You know, in New York City, for instance, they're finding polio um, and this delayed avoidance. Can you comment at all outside of, you know, the COVID grouping? of some philosophical uh, lack of access, um, anything from a high level. And then um, from really from specifically from your studies, why did you exclude the influenza vaccinations? And what was the data around the pediatric influenza um, vaccinations? So it's sort of a two prong, but just a question came through like, um, are we seeing something about this avoidance of vaccinations globally, given we're seeing, you know, polio resurfacing as an example? 
Yeah, I think that there are different reasons for ethnic, different ethnic groups because you'll see um, there's avoidance and rebounding of some of these diseases like polio, and it crosses different socioeconomic backgrounds. You know, you'll see uh, um, a measles outbreak in a very affluent community, and then you'll see a polio outbreak in a, in a less affluent, um, very uh, religious, secular community. Um, so it's it's. I think there's some distrust. Um, and I think there's some people that might um, not have seen these diseases that think that they don't need them. I think there might be some um, people who are seeking alternate alternatives to modern medicine. Um, I think there's probably a lot of different reasons. Um, the global question is really interesting and I haven't studied global um, avoidance of these encounters. Um, but I would expect that there's probably other pockets around the world where you're seeing the rebound as well. Um, so it's it's really interesting um, trying to get to the psychology of the avoidance of the encounters. But um, I think for this data specifically, when we see some uh, racial ethnic groups that are avoiding it at higher rates, it's probably more likely access and avoidance because of access. Um, that I think for this specific data set is is what I'm I'm thinking is the contributor. Um, and, and the second part was, um, Alyssa, I know I uh, rambled both of them together. Um, you excluded the influenza vaccinations um, and the data showed, and what did the data show around the pediatric influenza vaccine encounters? That yeah, so I excluded influenza for a few reasons, and that's because the patterns of um, where you get the vaccine and when you get it are very different than um, when you go into your two-year-old pedi pediatric appointment, your well, well child visit to get routine childhood vaccine. So there's a specific flu season. Um, you don't get the next year's flu vaccine until September, um, and then they don't give it year round. So you see that there's a few months in the middle where they just don't give it at all. Um, so the patterns to that are a little different. But interestingly, when I did look at the patterns just to see influenza on its own. Um, in 2021 compared to 2020, there were actually fewer encounters. And that might be because people are not getting it at their pediatrician and they're getting it at their CVS clinic, which we don't track. We're only tracking hospitals and, the, and their outpatient clinics. Um, so that also throws another wrench into that. You're not likely to get your MMR vaccine at your CVS, but your influenza, you're way more likely to get there. And have you tested the change in trend for statistical significance? Yeah, so we did. And it's it, across the board, and as you can probably guess by some of those really major differences in trends between 2019 to 2020 and 2021, it's statistically significant across the board. Um, and um, it really shows that there's a, a large gap that's persisting in those, those missed encounters that um, really needs attention. Now, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Um, if you have any questions, please um, put them in the chat um, chat box and we'll pull from them. And Alyssa, um, is there any plan to get the CVS data? Um, are they cooperating? You know, we have these data pools and these data silos. And here's a great example if we could get our hands on that, or you could have gotten your hands on this data to to bring it full circle. Any um, any you know uh, whispers of anything going on? I would love that. Unfortunately, um, so the Visiting Clinical Database is used by hospitals and outpatient clinics. It's not used by those retail clinics um, because there is membership fee and all of that. That it's it's really doesn't lend itself. Um, it's a performance improvement, quality improvement tool. So um, that's not as relevant to something like a CVS clinic. So unfortunately, I would love that data separately if I could get my hands on it, but um, integrated into this tool, it, it, it won't happen, um, unfortunately. And um, are you, what version or um, iterations are you on of this specific tool? And then I want to ask the same question to Allie on, you know, from um, Fair Health. Um, so this is a, a performance improvement database. So it's kind of constantly getting fed data. data. We get discharge claims uh, about 30 day lag. Um, so it gets updated essentially monthly. Um, yeah. So our data are refreshed on a monthly basis. Um, 
but the telehealth tracker that we have is usually a couple of months behind, but it too is updated on a monthly basis. Okay, wonderful. Alyssa, one more question. Regards to childhood vaccinations, any comments given your um, data here? Um, was the CDC interested in it? Did you, you know, how do you um, relate this to their recommendations, if at all? I know we're putting you out on a limb, so you don't, there's no correct answer, and we don't want yeah. to, you know, make you wiggle in the chair, but curiously. Yeah, no, actually, a lot of those CDC um, MMWRs are what spurred my research questions. So a lot of the things that they had put out about childhood vaccinations um, are what caused or made me interested to see what we were finding in our data. Um, it's in line with what they have found, which is lower rates of vaccination um, across the board. I think ours are, our findings are a bit more drastic. I showed a kindergarten study that showed 95 compared to 94% of, of, of kindergartners where um, we are seeing much larger gaps. Um, and that just due to the nature of what our data is compared to what they're capturing, which is a population data data set as opposed to um, a facility data set. Um, I'd like to ask each of you from your um, your um, expertises, what would you have done differently modeling your your research? If there was one thing that you would have done differently or could have done differently, maybe you didn't have to do anything because it was just spot on, but. Um, I'm going to ask you, Allie, then Trudy, then Alyssa. Allie, any questions? Sure. Um, so we're actually in a very unique position that we refresh this once a year with the things that people ask us to change and the things that we find of interest to add into the analysis. Obviously, in something that we're doing as a monthly dashboard, we can't put the world in. But we try very hard to cycle it so that it continually has interesting information within it that we feel that something is uh, very interesting. And uh, I guess I'm next. I think what I would have done differently is we focused our study on administrative claims data. And it would have been really great if we could have linked the claims data to clinical data from a, an electronic health record. Uh, and so I think those opportunities will come in the future as uh, APCDs work closely with uh, health information exchanges. That may be an opportunity to really expand some of this uh, detailed evaluation. And, and I think it's not necessarily something I would have changed, but maybe to take it a step further, I would have looked at the combination that, you know, the CDC has recommendations. Um, I might want to pair um, the patient's age and the recommendations to see if people are pushing things out a little further than they were pre-pandemic, um, just to see if if that has um, not necessarily um, fully avoiding it, but not having or not getting uh, vaccines in the time frame that's um, and, and the, re the recommendations. Um, uh, Allie, what what do you think do you the think future of the studies might look like post COVID? What would that look like? So with telehealth, we're starting to see that while it didn't come back to what it was pre pandemic. It definitely, telehealth has decreased in utilization um, and is continuing to find its norm, I would like to say, as people are finding what it really works for and what it doesn't. And what's really starting to pop out are that mental health services are really well tuned to being done via a telehealth or a video interactive type of session and that people don't have to go into the office for those types of things. That said, obviously, there's a lot of legislation around this. There's a lot of analysis around this, and I'm sure there will be additional changes to the landscape as time goes on. Interesting. Any comments on that, Trudy, from Ali, from um, Post Alley? I want to add to that. Well, I think in relationship to the tool that we've been working with, um, 
post-COVID pandemic, uh, there are some interesting applications of the tool. Most importantly is looking at the long-term effects of COVID, uh, which is obviously a current topic. And we've got several studies looking at that. And I think the tool is very useful for that purpose. But the other thing that we've uh, really have found from some of our studies is that there is uh, something called a post-ICU syndrome. And that is very evident in this uh, post-COVID that we found on the severity scale. The ones that were in the higher severities were all most likely in ICUs because they were on ventilation. And uh, other types of respiratory conditions that have been on ICU in ventilation, such as pneumonia or even influenza, have very similar long-term effects. So that's something I think that we really need to take a look at uh, through the use of this uh, severity rating. And um, were you able to, and this is just um, throwing this out there, I've seen it in the literature, based on the number of times someone was vaccinated or had a booster, um, did the severity of them, if they uh, did actually um, uh, come down with COVID, was it as severe as someone who perhaps was not as vaccinated as much? Does Can the data be that granularized to say trends and something like that and then perhaps we'd have to cross thatch you know comorbid states but just curious um what the data is screaming at us if at all i i really wish we could have done that the the sad thing is is that many of the vaccinations were given at a public venue uh and so yeah. were not recorded in claims and so it would be very unreliable to make any assumptions based on that. But now there are some uh, 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 diagnosis codes that report vaccination status, such as they have been vaccinated or they're partially vaccinated. And so we can start looking back at that. I was just going to say that those Z codes are huge for that type of analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great point, Trudy, because even in my neighborhood, they set up something in the SUNY parking lot and people were just jabbed and walked away mm -hmm. and they got like a little sticker and you know i lost mine so <laughs> um and you know so i had didn't have that documentation the first time around so i can see what you're saying that there's probably missed data opportunities there but at the time that wasn't the intent of you know collecting as much as saving lives correct yes so i think that's very powerful Alyssa, where are you going forward? And you'd like to comment. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I haven't taken a look at those Z codes. And I know that Z codes in general are notoriously undercoded. Mm -hmm. Have either of you taken or anyone taken a look at those COVID status Z codes to see if they're actually being utilized? I actually have. And we are seeing that they are being utilized in our data set, um, so, which is a great thing, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we have noticed that too. The The problem is though, it doesn't tell you when they got vaccinated. So you can't really link it with when they, when they got COVID or when they got, you know, other effects from it or not. And is it is it just a vaccine? So it doesn't tell you full series boosted and it just says post COVID or vaccine vaccinated. Okay. Actually, it does tell you the status, okay. whether they're under vaccinated, whether they're not vaccinated or whether they're fully vaccinated. There are three separate ones. Yeah. And then there are, J I'm sorry, there are J codes that will tell you which vaccine, if it was administered by a provider who had submitted it. Right. Yeah. Right. I have one more, you know, uh, philosophical um, point I'd like each of you to address. Based on your research and based on your tools that you've created, is is this process that you've created replicable to the next blah blah pandemic? Does it have to be COVID? You know, can it be? Can we use the same skeleton and plug in the next possible catastrophe? Um, go with I, Alyssa, Allie, Trudy, please. Yeah, so my process didn't actually look at COVID specifically. It just looked at childhood vaccinations during the time of COVID. So it's um, looking, you know, hyper-focused on when the pandemic started um, and the avoidance around that, but it really um, can go back or far out as, as needed. 
since ours is a telehealth study, um, and again, is not predicated on COVID, it's just using time-based periods. It can be looked at for the next 20 years if we want to look at it, if it's very interesting. So, And, and our tool was very COVID specific. However, it could be adapted for another uh, pandemic or condition that might emerge, but it was based on a respiratory condition because uh, the use of oxygen was a very key element in it. Mm. Very, very interesting. That's correct, Trudy. Charles, I would like to know if there's any additional questions from the audience. Um, everyone, one last minute, give us your pearls of wisdom and give us some mentoring for the future. Um, Alyssa, Allie, Trudy, and then we will be done with this fantastic session. Yeah, I think that the data show that COVID-19 really had an impact on people people's willingness to seek even elective health care. So um, even though we think of the pandemic as something that's maybe over, we're still seeing the effects of people avoiding the healthcare system, um, specifically in childhood vaccinations, with the rates being lower than they were pre-pandemic, where that results in you know hundreds of thousands of unvaccinated and under-vaccinated kids, which could lead to um, you know the the resurgence of some of these um, diseases that we haven't necessarily had to, to deal with in large volumes previously. Um, I guess mm, the only thing I can say is, you know, I know there is a lot of analysis being done with EMR data and such. I have been doing claims data analysis for years and years and years. And I actually appreciate claims data because it gives a fuller 360 degree view of patients as they go across. So the fact that Trudy used uh, claims data and we used claims data, you know, uh, don't, I guess don't underestimate the usage of claims data in your analyses. And, and I, I guess, did know that, um, oh, I'm sorry, Trudy. And Anne, you did mention, uh, you had a question. I want to step back before Trudy answers and closes this out. You wanted to know, does the analysis take into uh, consideration patients who may have received their vaccination at a drugstore or other retail location? And I think Alyssa answered that question. They don't get that data. Um, so if that is not what the, you were looking for, please uh, type back in the response. But Trudy, I apologize. Please uh, close us down here. Okay. Well, you asked for my words of wisdom as a closing. And, and I think that what I would say is that um, part of the reason we developed this tool was to uh, help standardize research and reporting. And we really hope that um, people have an interest in it and uh, request it and use it in their research. So when, when there are studies reporting on severity levels, it, it will be standardized and, and similar and easy to compare. Well, on behalf of NATO, on behalf of the NATO board with which I sit with some phenomenal people, we want to thank these phenomenal researchers, leaders um, of healthcare, um, Robin Gilbert, who spoke, and Ali Russo from Fair Health, Trudy Krause from University of Texas Health, and Alyssa Harris from Vizient. Um, we really appreciate all of your wisdom and trying to help those that we serve to help uh, humankind. And we got through this, and we this too shall pass. So on behalf of NATO, Norm Thurston, who is a phenomenal executive director, and of course, Charles, who is our be-all, end-all, um, who performs all the back uh, backdoor awesomeness. Uh, we want to thank you. If you have additional questions, please reach out to us. The speakers are happy to answer additional questions and share their uh, phenomenal um, data as well. And we hope you have a great rest of the day. And thank you for the honor of sitting in on this um, presentation with us. Have a great day.